Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to BrainMap. This seminar series is co-sponsored by the P41 funded Center for Mesoscale Mapping housed in the Martino Center. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Charles Kahn. Dr. Kahn is a professor and vice chair of radiology at the University of Pennsylvania. He is a board certified practicing radiologist with expertise in body CT and ultrasound and holds degrees in mathematics and computer sciences. His professional interests include health service research, decision support, artificial intelligence, information standards, and knowledge representation. His honors include the gold medal of the American Rentgen Ray Society, honorary membership of the Italian Society of Medical Radiology, an elected fellowship of the American College of, of Radiology, the American College of Medical Informatics, and the Society for Imaging Informatics and Radiology. He has created several internationally known information systems and authored more than 140 scientific articles. He has given more than 120 invited lectures. Uh, Professor Khan is the editor of the journal Radiology, Artificial Intelligence. I would just like to remind the audience to please address any question you have even during the talk using the Q&A box. Professor Khan, thank you very much for coming here today. The virtual stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Roy. It's, it's a real privilege uh, and, and a pleasure for me to get a chance to, uh, to meet with you all today. And uh, the title of, of my presentation today is Assuring High Quality Scientific Research in Medical Imaging AI. And I, I will say a lot of this uh, comes from uh, my perspective as uh, editor from, for the journal Radiology AI, which is published by RSNA, one of our large radiology societies. And, and I also want to say in that endeavor, I am uh, joined and regularly uh, learn a lot from uh, Jayashri Kalpati Kramer, who serves as a deputy editor uh, for the journal and, and really delighted uh, uh, to, uh, to work with her in that capacity. So I, I think as, as many of you know, a lot of the work that's being done in, in medical AI is, uh, it's very exciting. There's a lot of progress being made. It's challenging research. Um, we're, we're looking in topics and, and recently uh, looking at advances that have been made in, in deep learning technologies and as well uh, advances in radiomics that look at the multiple features that we get from, from the images that really go beyond what, what we're able to see and, and detect by eye. But the challenge in all of that, of course, is there are lots of ways in which the things that we develop, we build, our research can go wrong. And, and I guess I'd like to look at some of those with you today and talk a little bit about what a good research article should tell us, because this is really the way that we communicate our findings. And it's important that we build a, uh, our, our scientific work on a foundation that, uh, that makes sense to us. And I don't know if you can read the caption on here to the cartoon that says, it's time we face reality, my friends. We're not exactly rocket scientists. Um, just a reminder, of course, that uh, deep learning, which has engendered so much enthusiasm recently, and, and particularly in, in image-rich areas of, of medicine, like radiology and pathology, is really just one part, and even machine learning, it's just one part of the broader field of artificial intelligence that includes all manner of other things, such as automated reasoning and um, robotics and, and knowledge representation. But I think the because that most people have tended to kind of conflate deep learning with AI and but that's really where the this this talk in particular will will focus. Just to give you an idea of the number of papers that are coming out, those of us who try to keep up with the literature realize we can't. Um, some 55,000 papers uh, published and, and indexed in PubMed uh, in the last calendar year alone. Uh, and the trend is one of growth. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done in this area. And uh, even though we often find papers that uh, tout something, we, you know, there, uh, there's revelations down the road that uh, there have been problems with some of the work. So we really want to find ways that we can identify uh, improvements and, and uh, and make sure that the information that we rely on to build our 
scientific research is, is well grounded. And just kind of a, a reminder, here's sort of a hierarchy or uh, classification of some of the various techniques that have been used, um, including uh, some of the uh, more traditional statistically based methods, logistic regression and support vector machines, and then some of the, the neural networks tools, and, and then uh, various unsupervised clustering techniques and so forth that, that folks are using. And it's, it's not you know entirely complete, but it, it's not a bad way to, to think about some of the variety of different techniques that are, that are out there and for things for us to think about. As well, um, the you know I think the the key thing for us is the landscape and the way we approach um, the evaluation of the methods in these articles has changed significantly. Um, it used to be that we used either automated or even manual methods to segment out information from images and then applied a variety of uh, hand selected features that we would use, uh, things like uh, smoothness of margins and hist various histogram features, size, and other things, and put those into uh, a traditional machine learning approach and use that to do classification. Whereas obviously the approach with deep learning is we just feed it lots and lots of images and outcomes and answer at the end. And it makes it very challenging to determine all the and evaluate all of the aspects of, of these models. So this is just uh, somewhat of a broad outline of, of some of the features to think about when we look at uh, the various aspects of uh, a research project and of the a publication thereof. First off, starting with the hypothesis. Um, is it something quantitative or qualitative? Are they looking uh, as a retrospective study or is this being engaged as a prospective evaluation? To date, almost almost everything that's been done has been uh, retrospective. And is this a study of feasibility of a technique or actually looking at the performance of it, uh, doing a non-inferiority comparison to current methods, to the way uh, physicians might interpret an image, for example, and if so, um, against what is, uh, are they doing the comparison? So all of those factors are really important for us to think about when we start out. Uh, there are a variety of things that come into the questions about uh, the data that are used in the study. Uh, first off, uh, because we're dealing with information about our fellow humans, we really want to make sure that we protect their privacy and that information has been suitably de-identified uh, and that various data protection schemes are in place and that the, the work conforms to appropriate ethical standards. Um, it's a really critical and in particular for imaging information because so much of the effort of the research work goes into the preparation of the data for analysis that uh, we understand exactly how the data have been prepared and made uh, ready for the uh, for training a model and for its evaluation. So everything from data augmentation, how the data are have been partitioned into training, tuning, and testing sets, um, how the ground truth has been established. Uh, these are critical factors for all of us to uh, to recognize. For the AI model that's been applied, it's really useful to understand the architecture, uh, the software being used to implement it, how the model was initialized, if there was uh, some kind of pre-training uh, and, uh, and transfer learning was applied, and then uh, the rules that were used uh, to uh, determine the stopping points for, for training and, and evaluating the hyperparameters and what the training rules were. Uh, in terms of looking at these factors. And then uh, looking at the evaluation of these works, uh, there are a number of metrics. We'll talk about some of them, um, but uh, it's actually, there, there's a lot of work that's being done now to try to uh, standardize and come to some consensus about the metrics that we use for various tasks within uh, AI and medical imaging. And we're trying to see about 
um, how those can be applied. One of the things we don't see so often, but I think is tremendously helpful is to have sensitivity analysis to be able to understand exactly how robust a, uh, an AI model is. And then of course, to do external testing and, and the various statistical analyses are also key components of uh, the analysis of these works. So let's, let's just kind of go in and walk through what, uh, what's included in, in, uh, in a manuscript, starting with the hypothesis. Is it clearly defined? Is it something that addresses a specific clinical or scientific question um, that's important? and is something uh, that has been identified as the question that they're posing, uh, that the authors are posing, and it's something that can be solved. And is it a testable hypothesis is always a key question for us. When we look at the variety of studies that are out there, um, often people are interested in um, developing models or showing their, an application of a model. And it's important to understand the distinction there and very often too, uh, it, it really is a question of whether the study has been designed to uh, simply explore the feasibility of using a technique uh, or whether it's truly to test that technique in clinical practice. And then to that end, it's important to understand whether the work is being done retrospectively and being applied to a collection of cases that have already been accrued or looking to do a prospective analysis where one's looking to uh, apply the technique to cases that are fresh as they're, as they're coming in. In terms of the data, um, we really want to understand where, where they came from, how, how any of the variables uh, were defined uh, for, uh, for imaging studies, certainly knowing the types of uh, sequences, for example, and uh, how the, how the uh, images were generated is, is useful to us. And then if for particular variables that are being captured and defined, uh, it's, if we can, uh, there's a real opportunity to, uh, to build and, and standardize on that. And uh, there's an effort uh, that's been led by uh, RSNA and the American College of Radiology in, to address common data elements for uh, radiology in particular. And uh, there's a site called radelement.org that's uh, supported by those two organizations that has additional information about, about those and has uh, particular definitions. It serves as a data dictionary effectively for those common data elements. Among the other things we want to think about when we look at uh, the data that are being used in a, in a study what were the inclusion and exclusion criteria? Were certain patients excluded from analysis? And if so, why? Um, how did the authors determine the quantity of data uh, to be used in their analysis? What was the stopping point? Did they actually do a, a power analysis, for example, to determine an appropriate number of, of examinations or, or uh, images to include in order to assure that the statistical results that they get are, are valid. And for those of us in, in clinical practice, it's really interesting to try to under, and important to understand how well the, the training data match the intended clinical use of the AI model. Um, and it really becomes critical, at, particularly as well for the test set that we identify uh, data sets that, that match and, and model the range of patients that we expect to see in our own, our own practices. This is that, uh, that website. Actually, it's the, uh, you'll see, if you go out to radelement.org, you'll see it looks a bit different. They've updated the uh, site since this version of it, but it includes a variety of data elements and uh, sets of, of data elements. And it's been a really important effort led by these two radiology societies. And uh, along with that, uh, an article that uh, comes from a, a number of folks who've been involved in that effort that talks about some of the various tools uh, that support uh, informatics tools that have been developed by ACR and RSNA that support um, the uh, AI initiatives uh, in radiology in particular.
And this is just showing what uh, what some of these look like. This is a, a use case uh, that's defined by the American College of Radiology for uh, detection of appendicitis, um, and then the corresponding data element uh, from the rad element site. One of the other key things that's a little bit different about dealing with information from, from radiology than with some other sources uh, is the, the issues of de-identification. And it's, it's really important for uh, those of us, particularly who, who manage journals and who are involved in the editorial process, because often we're, although we're not the people who are organizing and approving these studies, it's really kind of to us to assure that the information that is published about them it conforms to, to ethical guidelines. And to that end, <clears throat> we really want to make sure that the information is appropriately de-identified. Um, as many of you may be aware, DICOM, which is the format for exchange of medical imaging information, uh, has a set of uh, fields that contain or are defined to contain uh, patient identifiers, name, medical record number, age, often even address or other factors. Um, and most uh, pieces of software that do anonymization will uh, remove those, but it's often the case that people will put data into what are so-called private tags um, where you may not might not think to look. With imaging, we also have some additional problems in that the uh, information that identifies the patient can actually appear in the image itself. We've seen examples of patients wearing jewelry with their name on it, um, patients who have uh, implanted devices like pacemakers will often have uh, a serial number that's visible on a radiograph, for example, um, which allows someone to identify them. And some images, in particular ultrasound images, uh, will often have burned in labels that actually are part of the imaging data. Um, as you see in the images over on the right, it's not difficult to take a 3D view of the head, either CT or MRI, and to generate a, a facial view from that. And in fact, a view such as, uh, as these is something that could be matched against driver's license photographs to re-identify a patient. And for the reporting, the text information that goes along with, uh, with radiology images, well, the challenge is often that patient names and provider names uh, can appear in those reports. And uh, there are some techniques that have been used, one of them called hide in plain sight, which if it finds a name, it substitutes a made up uh, some other name <clears throat> uh, instead with the hope that um, someone subsequently looking for that information uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't notice if you had missed one. Uh, there are some little tricks you can do, unfortunately, though, that, uh, that bypass that technique, and no one has really found a, a really ideal de-identification de 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 technique. We tried a lot of them, actually, our, our research group, <clears throat> against uh, a corpus of radiology reports. And one of the challenges is that um, reports do contain information, mostly date information, um, which we can date shift or, or just... Uh, uh, block out from the report, but it's often finding names because they occur so infrequently that can be a real challenge. And I, I love this, uh, this example. This was a tweet by uh, Alexandre Kadran uh, um where he took uh, three members of the uh, Canadian Association of Radiologists who apparently uh, all serve on the uh, AI committee for that society and, and I don't know if it's a requirement that they all have uh, head MRs, but they all seem to. And the, so the, the game here to be played is, can you match the, uh, the uh, MR images with the, uh, with the facial profile and with the photograph of the member of, of their group? And <clears throat> in fact, it's, uh, I think you'll find it's, it's not all that difficult to do. So I think it, it was kind of a fun little, little point, but it is, it's a valid concern um, that we have to address that um, even taking out uh, some of the skin 
information in the soft tissue may not be enough if people can actually, mo I suspect people will be able to model off of uh, even the, the skull profile for a lot of these. It won't look like a facial profile image, but it's one of the challenges I think ahead of us. The other part, and th this isn't so much something that, that we think about necessarily when, <clears throat> when reviewing an article, but I think it's really tremendously important for all of us to think about. And that is, um, if we don't look for potential of bias in the data sets that come with AI, uh, in the manner in which AI systems are uh, tested or deployed, I don't think we'll find biases. And um, these can often be insidious. This uh, report from Obermeyer that I think many people are, are familiar with um, found racial bias in an algorithm that was used to uh, direct healthcare resources. And it did so based on the fact that historically black patients had received less healthcare resources. And so it inferred that that was the behavior that it was meant to uh, emulate and uh, that was the correct answer to the problem. So I think we have to be extremely careful about all of these things when we when we look to implement these algorithms. And if we don't look for potential biases, uh, we won't find them. I think too, one of the key issues for us going forward is identifying what the ground truth of, uh, of these exams is. Uh, we need to know that uh, whatever the answer is, it's well-defined. And we really want to have a sense uh, if we're looking at the scientific value of a study as to, to who or, or what, in the case of an algorithm, annotated the information and made it available to us. What were their, the qualifications and training of those individuals? Uh, what instructions were they given on how to annotate the data? Uh, what was the variability? Uh, both uh, inter-rater and intra-rater variability? And was it done if, if by more than one annotator, was, was there any attempt made uh, to look at uh, the variation between the two? Or were they blinded? And, and how were any discrepancies adjudicated? Um, I include this image here. Uh, this was actually um, a group of uh, non-medical professionals who were annotating colonoscopy images uh, to identify polyps uh, in video images of colonoscopy exams. Um, I don't think it's necessarily unreasonable that uh, these people who were not medical professionals were, uh, were doing the annotation. And I suspect they actually probably did so with a pretty high degree of performance if they were properly trained. But I think it's really important for all of us that when we start to look at these algorithms and how they were trained, that we understand exactly what the, the training basis of, of, of the, uh, the models was. And this was, to, uh, just as an example, this was uh, work that was done for the uh, pneumonia detection challenge that RSNA conducted several years ago, in which case that they had for um, the test set, they had, uh, they took the uh, chest x-ray 14 data set that NIH had released, they took some 30,000 uh, images uh, from that set, and had in this case, three expert chest radiologists label the images and draw bounding boxes on them to identify the areas that had pneumonia. And then um, if uh, to, to resolve discrepancies, what they did was they took the intersection of those three bounding boxes that were drawn by the, the three radiologists. But it, it, it really shows, and I think one of the, the challenges, and you can see there's a fair amount of difference here and, and kind of overlap of how, uh, how, how different people approach this and, and the, the different sets, but it actually provides a lot of valuable information um, for, uh, for researchers, and but also kind of an important lesson for all of us as to, um, how to go about striking ground truth with these exams. And uh, knowing how that is done uh, is one of the things that, that helps us better evaluate the, uh, the work that's done subsequently. As, as most of you, I suspect, know, much of the work that gets done in AI is not the algorithm building, it's, it's wrangling the data 
and knowing exactly what kind of software, the versioning, the libraries that were used, the, the specific options is tremendously important. How the data might have been normalized, whether data augmentation was performed, these are all important parts of understanding uh, the work that's been done. Um, in terms of data preparation, a lot of times much of the work is normalization. It's resampling an image, uh, putting it into a different image size or bit depth than the way it was acquired. Um, perhaps it's uh, adjusting it to a certain uh, window and level scheme, but all of these things are, are critical for us to understand uh, how the data were prepared and, and again to give us a way that we can understand better how, uh, how suitable this information is to generalize going forward. Um, a lot of techniques for data augmentation uh, that have been, been used and certainly many of the things that you would think uh, might work uh, don't work so well in, in medical imaging. Uh, so for example, if you have a, uh, a head MR image here, um, it's reasonable to do a horizontal flip, but you couldn't do a vertical flip. You really don't want to put the parts of the brain that are posterior and flip them with the parts that are anterior. That would not be appropriate. Uh, but there are some ways that you can do some affine mapping, maybe some scaling. You can kind of slide things a little bit. Um, and there are ways that you can, can change the image uh, with, with the hope, of course, with all of these augmentation efforts that what you're really doing is helping the AI model learn the variations of an image that are not important so that the patterns that it eventually trains on and sees are, uh, will be the things that actually are, are the features of the image that you want it to capture. And then understanding how the imaging model, the AI model was was trained if there was some kind of pre-training of it. M many of the um, systems that we use now come pre-trained uh, and using ImageNet. Uh, the challenge with that, I mean, it, it's ImageNet's an amazing resource, but of course the challenge for us in doing this is th these are, are all based on photographic images, not uh, medical images. Um, and they're all typically color images and that means a different bit depth. Um, so it, it's, uh, we, we don't yet have a, a medical image net that we can, we can train on, but that may be one of the goals and, and given the success of image net and, and to be honest, you know, that even the current systems that are built off of image net function pretty well in, in medical settings. Another piece of information that we need to understand um, how well a, a a piece of science is being presented was how the data were partitioned. Um, we expect that the partitions are disjoint. Uh, typical ratio, as you see here, is 70% being used to train the set, 20% uh, as the validation set or tuning set, and 10% typically for testing. Uh, but it's tremendously important to understand if there are any differences. Um, very often, it's the case that um, if one is looking at a very rare condition, for example, or one that incur occurs infrequently in, in the, the uh, training data set, that one might look to enrich the test set to have more examples of that um, to, to assure that the system is functioning properly. Um, we also want to make sure that this, the uh, study data are appropriately disjoint, that uh, we've separated out by uh, typically uh, at least by patient, because um, I've, I've seen studies that people have uh, submitted to, the, to our journal where um, it, it hasn't been that uh, every other image was, you know, one was test and, and one was uh, training, but you really don't want images being used from the same patient uh, because they're going to look so similar potentially from one uh, slice to the next that that would uh, tend to game the system and, and make the results look artificially better than they are. There are a large variety of architectures. Uh, to, to be honest, I think what's going to happen, and we're starting to see this a bit, is um, 
although we, we certainly want to understand the architectures that people are using, I think more and more we're going to be seeing um, a variety of commercial systems and systems that are uh, coming into the literature, at least on the clinical evaluation side, where um, people basically bought a, uh, you know, they licensed the use of a system from a vendor and really don't have much information about the internal architecture of that system. All they can do is present the results of that system. Uh, so I think in the, along the way, in terms of doing uh, our duty as, as scientific reviewers, we want to understand the architectures, uh, but I think increasingly it, uh, more and more of this may be rather opaque to us. I just put this slide in here, just uh, remind that, you know, that uh, in terms of the details of the uh, convolutional neural networks, what, which types of kernels uh, might end up being used in terms of the analysis is uh, important for us to understand from the scientific perspective, um, particularly for newer approaches that people are developing. But again, probably going downstream, we, we may not be seeing as much of this level of detail uh, in the works that are being presented. In the way people are looking at evaluating models, it's, it's really important too to understand um, how many models were built by the developers and evaluated against the test set and how were those models selected. Ideally, they identified one model. Uh, if they developed more than one model, we'd like to understand why. Um, we do see some works like on occasion where people will develop uh, two models or perhaps more to look at uh, the uh, inter-observer agreement of those two models, building two AI models to see if they actually come both come close to, uh, to finding the answer and to see how well they do so. Um, I think many of you may also be familiar with uh, this study that was published in the Korean Journal of Radiology, where the researchers looked at some 516 studies that had performed machine learning work uh, in uh, on medical imaging information and found that only 6%, 31 of those studies had conducted external validation. And of those 31 studies, uh, none of them had uh, adopted all three of the design features of uh, identifying the diagnostic cohort, including multiple institutions and doing prospective data collection for external validation. So, there's a bit of a, you know, we're, we're still pretty young in some ways in the application of these AI techniques in healthcare, but I think going forward, it's going to be really critical for us uh, to assure that the, the quality of the work that we're presenting really starts, we start demanding this kind of information from, uh, from the manuscripts that are, that are proffered to our journals. <clears throat> there's a lot of work being done currently. Actually, there's a, a group from uh, Mikai and the Monai Collaborative uh, that's looking at uh, standardizing nomenclature and standardizing the various metrics um, that are used across the variety of AI applications. When a vendor or a uh, scientific developer touts the performance of an AI system. Uh, it's often based on something like the dice coefficient or uh, Sorensen dice, if you prefer. Um, the Jacquard index or Hausdorff distance, all of these things are perfectly valid uh, ways, but uh, often they can, uh, one can game the system to some extent by choosing a favorable uh, metric. And so it's really important to understand what, what the metrics are, what, what's been used in the particular article, and uh, whether it's the most appropriate one in, in that setting. Also, too, I think we want to look at the performance of, of various models, uh, whether it's a, an issue of overfitting uh, or underfitting to the problem at, at hand, and to have uh, some understanding of that, because given the number of parameters that go into 
and, and can be learned in, in the various deep learning models, it can be very easy for these systems to, uh, to overfit a particular uh, testing set. And uh, one of the, the real challenges for us, I think with all of these systems is, is to understand the features that really are being detected. You know, AI is, is and, and deep learning systems are wonderfully good at identifying patterns. The challenge for us as humans is we don't always understand the patterns that they're finding. So we know uh, that it's often the case that, uh, for example, systems that were built to detect pneumothorax on chest X-rays, which is air uh, inside the chest, but outside the lungs. Um, in fact, uh, those systems, what they ended up detecting was the presence of a chest tube, which had been placed to treat the pneumothorax. In this case, uh, this example was um, from two hospitals that had uh, trained systems for a system for an AI model for detection of pneumonia. And they had done so at two different institutions. One institution was mostly inpatients, had about 30% uh, cases of pneumonia. The other institution was mostly outpatient, only about 1% of the patients had pneumonia. And when they asked the AI system using a heat map such as this, you know, what, uh, what is the key feature of the image that tells you whether or not the patient has pneumonia? The computer said, it's the letter L. And in fact, the, the shape of the letter L with the uh, Here's in, on the left image showing it <clears throat> in kind of normal orientation on that black circle and the reverse letter L on the right was the way the, the, the uh, AI model was able to detect the two different hospitals and the prevalence of pneumonia in the two. And it found that that was the feature that gave it the most information about uh, whether or not the patient had pneumonia. So the challenge for, all, for us when we look at any of these things is to really understand wherever possible how well these systems perform, but if they really have learned and identified the features that are important to us. To me, uh, one of the fascinating uh, aspects of, uh, of deep learning is this notion of adversarial images or adversarial attacks, the notion that you take an image such as the one on the left that uh, the model classifies with 58% confidence as being a panda, and we add a tiny amount of speckle noise to it. Um, and the image on the right, which looks absolutely no different uh, to the human eye, and we would still classify as a panda, gets rated as a gibbon by the model with 99% confidence. And although we find that, you know, th those sorts of things are amusing, the fact is that uh, this happens with medical images as well, that you can take a, a photograph of a skin lesion that gets classified as almost certainly benign, add a trace amount of noise to it, and that same, that uh, enhanced image, if you will, comes back as being judged to be malignant, even doing uh, a series of rotations on an image. So clearly there's something about these images and the features in them that we're not capturing, we're not uh, understanding well. And I think this is one of the things that we really want to be able to, uh, to better understand going, going forward. Um, a key consideration for us as well is this idea of leakage, whether uh, information that uh, is known in some way gets presented as an unknown. Uh, in other words, whether, for example, outcomes uh, in various independent variables like a risk factor uh, can, is used to predict the, the future itself. Um, something like, uh, you know, if you have a risk factor that, uh, or a piece of information about the, uh, the course of the patient and that somehow finds its way back in and, and predicts the course, that, that's a problem. Um, very often, uh, we have we see information in terms of validation, where some information, ground truth information from the training set, uh, propagates into the validation set, and so basically that same information is used for for training and validation, or for training and testing, and all of these things we have to look out for and, and address. And I think there are a variety of ways that people are familiar in terms of looking at. 
uh, the evaluation of various models. I think many people are familiar with the receiver operating curve analysis, but I just want to talk about uh, some of these other techniques because they're really important for us to see calibration curves, a confusion matrix, and then just even a review of misclassifications is helpful. The, the ROC curve, I think we're, a lot of people are familiar with, it's based on this notion that you have two different normal distributions, one for uh, uh, patient, for each of the two classes that you're evaluating, say positive and negative, and it allows you to, to plot an operating point for each of the various thresholds uh, that you would, would look at. And obviously the goal is uh, to get the area under this curve as close to one as, as possible. Um, I think this is kind of the typical way that we often look at these, but it, it can miss the point too. And that is, um, depending on the setting, it can have different utility, different value to um, identify patients at the more sensitive end or the more specific end. And in fact, um, it often can be the case that based on the various utilities or disutilities of identifying something as a positive finding, you may want to set your operating point accordingly. Um, so, uh, and that depends on the nature of the disease, the costs of exploring it, for example, and, and, and potentially the cost of missing uh, a finding. Calibration curves, I think, are a little less familiar to, to many researchers. And what they seek to do is to show the agreement between a model's predictions and the observed outcome. So for example, um, if you have a group of cases that you subset out and you've identified those as the ones that the model predicts as being positive with 70% certainty, then the model is well calibrated if 70% of those cases actually are positive. So this was some work uh, from uh, that I did uh, collaborated on with Beth Burnside uh, several years back. Um, and here we're presenting uh, the actual prevalence of malignancy versus the estimated risk and looking at each decile. So breaking it into uh, various groups in terms of the probability scale. But it gives you an idea too of um, the performance of a model and not just information uh, about the, uh, the ROC, but it actually shows you at certain points uh, along the curve that the model may over or under estimate uh, the prevalence of disease. And it's important to understand that in the way you apply the model. I find it really helpful if, if people are doing a, uh, a prediction task to show the confusion matrix, to show how many cases were assigned correctly, but actually to see if there is a pattern as to where they were assigned incorrectly. I think this is tremendously important information. And along with that, this was actually from, in fact, the first paper that was uh, published uh, in the Radiology AI journal, looking at risk fractures, but actually presented some illustrations of cases where their algorithm uh, both found false positives and false negatives. And that's, I think, for those of us, particularly on the clinical side, it's really useful to understand what types of issues these algorithms have trouble with. And it lets us therefore uh, take that information into account when we um, think about the outcomes and, and use these systems as, as part of the, the clinical milieu. So, in summary, I mean, really to, de to deliver high quality science, we want a hypothesis that's well-defined, testable, and innovative. Uh, we want to know that the methods that have been applied are appropriate to testing that hypothesis. We need to see them described in detail uh, and using the correct metrics. The results, uh, we really want an appropriate level of, of detail to understand the work and then the discussion in a scientific paper really should do four things. It should summarize the results, not restate them, but, but provide some summary understanding of them. Place that work into context so that we understand why these results are important in relation to prior work that's been done. Describe the limitations of the current study uh, so that we, we know what uh, 
what the authors saw as as flaws and no no study is perfect every study has limitations but it's critical that we understand those and be able to take those into account and then we can use that information as well to help us envision what's the next step how can we incorporate that information into into further research so just a couple of uh, resources for you to look at. This was an article uh, in AJR that talked about uh, various metrics and, and I think uh, probably more for clinicians rather than for AI researchers, uh, but trying to understand some of the evaluation metrics and how people look at uh, machine learning. There is a radiomics quality score that was published by uh, Lamba uh, that is uh, useful for understanding uh, the various uh, approaches to uh, evaluating radiomics manuscripts. Our group actually published something called CLAIM, the Checklist for Artificial Intelligence in Medical Imaging. It's not radiology specific. In fact, we really built it with the intent of looking at uh, all types of medical imaging tasks, but it, it folk, it's built on the STARD guidelines, which are used for reporting uh, diagnostic uh, results, accuracy of diagnostic studies, uh, but really focused on uh, providing more detail into AI and particularly for medical imaging studies. Uh, there are some uh, specialized things to think about uh, as, as we discussed uh, in terms of the pre-training, transfer learning, the data augmentation and such that are, that are particular to imaging. Um, and to be able to understand that and, and make sure that we have adequate detail of those features to make uh, good judgments about a paper. And then a couple of other uh, standards have come out. Uh, these largely from uh, Stanford and, and UCSF uh, groups. Um, Minimar as a set of uh, reporting standards for AI in healthcare, mostly to describe the population information. And again, a, a set of minimal information uh, for clinical artificial intelligence modeling. There are, in addition, a number of these. The STARD group is actually working now. Um, this is an international uh, group uh, working at a consensus process to come out with a STARD AI guideline. Um, the recently published Consort AI and uh, Tripod AI guidelines are out there and these have been done as uh, consensus statements and they're, they're useful. Consort uh, is a set of guidelines for reporting clinical trials. Um, and then uh, this was uh, a plea by uh, Sung Ho Park and, and Herb Kressel. Herb is a past editor of the journal Radiology. Um, looking at how we can connect innovation in AI and how uh, peer-reviewed medical journals can help support that process uh, through rigorous validation and, and other approaches to assure that we really do drive high quality science and, and help the field move forward. So with that, I, I just wanna say thank you again. It's been, uh, it, it's been a pleasure to have this opportunity and I, I look forward to, uh, to answering questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Khan, for this great talk. Uh, we already have a few questions ready. Um, Michael, can you please unmute? Hello? Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Hi, Dr. Khan. This was just terrific. Um, I have a question that may be a little bit in the weeds, but um, I think there's probably several people listening in who are reviewers. And uh, one thing I've noticed recently that uh, there seems to be increasing use in addition to, or sometimes even instead of the AUC ROC for assessing accuracy and performance with this F1 statistic and uh, metric. And specifically in reader studies, it's kind of the harmonic mean between the- Sensitivity and specificity, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. And I'm just wondering which is the better or more correct one to use to compare to reader accuracy if you're doing a multi-reader study 
or is it just another useful metric and you'd want to see both? But I'm not sure how to interpret it. Yeah, you know, it, it, to, to be honest, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, you know, as much as we can, you know, we all love to be able to summarize things into one statistic, right? I mean, so when we look at um, ROC studies, we, we boil it down to the area under the curve. But the truth is, you can only say that one uh, study, you know, unless you have one curve that um, dominates another one. In other words, that everywhere along, every point along that curve, let's say for an ROC, you know, curve A is uh, to the left of curve B, right? So it has the higher value. Then you can say that study A is better. But it's often the case that the curves, you know, those lines will overlap, they'll intersect so that at certain operating points, one methodology may be more sensitive, the other may be more specific, and that one number doesn't necessarily capture that. But the, the challenge, you know, I think the F1, it, it tries to effectively blend the sensitivity and specificity, but it in, in doing so, it reduces the amount of information that's available to you to understand what's really going on with with the uh, the, the process you know that's that's being studied. Okay. And, and, yeah, you know I, I'm I'm I, you know I'm I admit I'm a simple guy. I, if someone can explain something <laughs> yep. to me and give me one number and you know it's like I understand that you know a hundred grams of chocolate is better than 50 grams of chocolate, you know? So uh, I, you know, that, that part I can understand, but it actually gets to be, it's pretty challenging. And, and as I said, one of the dangers even with, with the ROC methodology is um, even if one is not, you know, is better, has a better area under the curve, it may not matter because at the threshold that you're interested in, let's yep. say you're doing a, let's say you're doing mammography yep. detection and you want to assure that it's 95% sensitive. Um, you really just want to look yeah. then at that point, right? And yeah, so. As, as you said earlier, you know, are, what is the use case? And are you trying to optimize sensitivity or specificity and having a metric that is kind of, you know, combining Blend. both yeah. may not be relevant to how you're planning to apply this AI clinically. Yeah, and there's even been a fair amount of work of taking the ROC data and then looking at uh, and, and blending that with utility information, right? And, and so that you're combining the sensitivity and specificity with the, let's say the downstream costs and utilities so that um, in the case of mammography, you know, you'd be looking at everything from what it's going to cost, you know, for every case that on a screening mammo that you refer to biopsy. So you're going to have incur those as costs, you're going to incur uh, the cost to the patient in terms of anxiety and, you know, and, and complexity versus the cost of not calling something which might include, say, <laughs> You know your your malpractice liability potentially, right? That so there's kind of a people you know will do economic and utility analyses on these things, and and that can make the information from a, an ROC curve even more sophisticated. Yep, great, thank you. That's helpful. Thanks for a great question. Thank you. Next question by Daniel. So, uh, hi, uh, I had a question on uh, interpretable machine learning. This came up in our, uh, in our journal club, uh, making models that have human interpretable um, parameters. And they argued that that's really key in high stakes decision-making such as medical um, type of, of, of decisions and that it doesn't affect accuracy, but it does seem like it would be a lot more effort in developing those models and training those models. And I just wondered where, where is the radiology field in that? And is that something that is going to be required or should be required? That's it. Thanks, Daniel. That's a great, great question. Um, the, uh, 
you know, I guess to some extent, well, for example, the WHO just announced that uh, they're going to, uh, you know, they, they're going to kind of recommend that AI read chest radiographs for TB rather than humans, right? And so there, you know, you kind of said, well, the system, it works, it works well enough. Does it generate explanation? No. You know, like anything else, it just says, I see this and but it gives you an answer, but in under-resourced countries where they don't have, you know, in, instead of having a, a thousand radiologists per, you know, million population, they've got one, um, you know, they're not, they, they can't do that with human readers, right? So it makes a lot of sense economically. There are techniques though, that one can, can bring to bear that, uh, com, you know, that seek to kind of combine these things. We actually, uh, and I'll, Mauricio Reyes led a panel at Mikai on explainable AI and actually wrote a really nice review article uh, that appeared that he in our so I'll make a plug for that in the radiology AI uh, journal and uh, described a variety of techniques you know so really anything from you know the the saliency map heat map type images right with the letter L as an example and I know yeah. uh, Jayashree Kapathy Kramer has has shown some nice, uh, done some really nice work at showing how uh, those saliency maps fall down, and and they're not even, you know, they can be rather uh, capricious and in <laughs> inaccurate in identifying features within images. Um, some other nice work actually uh, combined using deep learning to identify the anatomy and identify the features. And combine that with Bayesian networks to do the um, uh, generate the diagnosis, for example. So the the deep learning system says, okay, I know that there's increased T2 signal <clears throat> in the putamen. I don't know what that means. And then having a Bayesian network layered on top of that that says, you know, in this disease with patients with with this age and you know sex that uh, you know the uh, probability of having increased T2 signal is this, <clears throat> and then using the Bayesian network. And the advantage of that is the Bayes net, you can generate explanations out of it. Um, okay. Personally, uh, I get, so um, I, I, I'm generally suspicious of, of neural networks because I don't know what the heck is going on inside them. Um, yeah. The problem with neural networks is they work. Um, yeah. You know, often they generate amazing, fantastic results, and maybe they get it right 99 times out of 100. But, you know, it, it depends kind of on what that stake, you know, what the stakes are. It's kind of like, you know, the, the right. self-driving cars, right? I mean, they, you know, if, if you told me that a self-driving car was perfectly good at 99 out of 100 miles, but on that, on one mile out of 100, it was likely going to kill somebody. Um, you know, we, we might have a problem with, with that car. Uh, so yeah, yeah. The, the authors pointed out exactly these, these, these two cases here. And, you know, they, as an example of low stakes, it was like advertising. Well, you know, who cares if you get the wrong advertising, but yeah. Do I want to be in a self-driving car when I don't really know what it's actually focused on and why it's making the decisions to turn left or stop or go, um, you know, that gets a little bit less comfortable because I don't know if I really trust this because I don't really know how it works inside. Well, uh, and, and, you know, in a way the to me, these adversarial images, the adversarial attacks um, mm -hmm. highlight in a way exactly how much we don't know about what goes on inside these models because that panda should still be a panda after adding a little bit of speckle noise to it, right? So yeah. what is it about the image that all of a sudden became more Gibbon-like? And so there's, there's something in that, that that tells us that we need to, to make some of this somehow more robust um, and that, um, you know, maybe adding speckle noise of different kinds ought to be part of the training process with these images, right? That that just needs to be part of, you know, the augmentation of the training data to in order to get around that. Yeah, there was another great example, of, you know, an apple and that, you know, network described it as an apple. And then somebody wrote a post-it note that said iPod. And then it said, that's an iPod. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's reading the letters now. I mean, great job, but it's, 
it's still an apple yeah yeah although at least they got the brand right so that's good <laughs> yeah exactly yeah great question thanks uh, thank you next question by brian can you please unmute Brian, can you try again? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. Thanks for the uh, the really great presentation. Um, so I've done some work on training models for image reconstruction. And I was wondering if I could get your perspective on how to evaluate these things. So I think one of the, the sort of first first idea is to you know look at all the images you can that have pathology see how the network works on those but then how do you know when enough is enough so i think you know maybe maybe you can try and apply some of the methods that you use for you know quantitative models when you have a diagnosis based on the reconstructed images but it seems sort of uh, unsatisfactory to me in, in, in a sense. So you're, you're doing the image reconstruction, like from K space into, uh, you know, for MR in, into Cartesian right. or, or, or for CT reconstruction, you know, uh, first off, I will, I'll just start by saying I was the first time I saw people doing this, I was kind of blown away that we could actually do, you know, do this as a deep learning based activity instead of an analytic method, right? Instead of a formula based um, method. I, you know, I, I honestly, I, I will say this is not my particular area of expertise. I don't know uh, in particular what criteria people are using. Obviously they're using, uh, folks are doing various subtraction images and, and looking at the various features and, and looking uh, root mean square error and various other kinds of metrics. Um, but I, I think it's going to take a little bit of nuance. We, you know, if I, if you go back to some of the, like the, uh, iterative reconstruction methods that people developed for CT, uh, going, you know, at the beginning, the images looked quite, really quite good. But what we started noticing was that, for example, around the periphery of the lungs, there was a loss of detail. Um, and I, I so I guess what what I would most encourage you to do is to you know depending on where you where you're going to be applying the particular uh, application that you're doing get some get some clinical folks involved and and make sure that they identify some some images I mean now the flip side of that is we're seeing some great applications of it right in terms of being able to remove uh, you know a lot of the problems that have bedeviled us things like a streak artifact in the pelvis and, and all of that uh, from, you know, orthopedic hardware or um, various other things. So. Cool. Thank see, you so much. I see we're at the, the top. We're a little past the top of the hour here. I don't know if we need to or if we need to. I we... think we're, we're in excellent timing and just uh, took I think all of the questions that we have so far, and if there's any other question that would come up, I, I can try and connect this person to you, or maybe- Please do, uh, please, great. and please, uh, I, I would say, please feel free to uh, to uh, email me. I'd be, uh, I'd be very happy to uh, continue the conversation. And uh, it, I just wanna say thank you again uh, for, for the opportunity to, to visit with you all and, and for, the, for the really excellent uh, questions. Thank you so much. So on behalf of everyone, and we hope to see you in person next time. <laughs> Your pleasure. Yeah. Take care. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone.